So we were looking at ignition and then we were looking at ignition as a somewhat like a reverse process of uh, quenching not exactly but you look at the numbers to be slightly different but uh, the, the processes basically have the same idea therefore uh, we could now think about again to, to like a, a, a parallel plates what I was saying yesterday is uh, instead of having like a global energy balance we could actually have a uh, local energy balance so let us look at a different approach to do this to probably get the same results again so or similar results so consider a gas between uh, two infinite parallel plates and uh, now what we are saying is at ignition that is one of the criteria that we listed so at ignition we need to have d, uh, d by dx of minus k dt by dx equal to w q uh, where this is actually the uh, should should use a different symbol here maybe the q r so this is the uh, chemical heat release or uh, the heat of reaction and uh, therefore you could say d squared t over dt squared dx squared uh, which is so this is the conduction heat loss that is q small q and that is equal to the chemical reaction rate right. So uh, that is equal to uh, so, so if you now assume constant k then you are going to get uh, minus q r divided by k um, and you can now write this a uh, uh, w dot as a e to the minus e over r t um, y f power p y o power q right keep in mind that this q is not the same as that uh, so we, we run out of symbols pretty soon because we use kind of pretty much the same kind of symbols most of the time you could say m and n but uh, that is fine. Um, now the reason why we have to write the w dot like this is because this is a differential equation in temperature and the temperature shows up here so that means when you now integrate this strictly speaking we should think about like bringing this down here and then taking it up there and integrating and so on. Now that is of course uh, an involved process so let us actually try to see how we can manipulate this a little bit more so introduce non dimensionalization um, eta equals x over capital R that is uh, non dimensionalizing the length and uh, now let us suppose that nu stands for uh, T minus T naught that is a departure from the uh, wall temperature for the for the gas and uh, let us say theta equals E times T minus T naught divided by or T naught square this is not the same as uh, our Zeldovich factor because we used to have a TF keep in mind. Um, and uh, so obviously then this can be written as u e nu divided by r t naught squared. Now note that uh, we were saying nu is quite small when compared to t naught that means we are looking at small departures from t naught for the temperature near the wall and uh, if you have this notion then e to the minus e over r t can be expanded about t naught uh, as uh, exponential of uh, negative e over r um, t naught plus nu and uh, that can be written as uh, exponential of minus uh, e over r t naught times 1 plus nu over t naught and then you do a binomial approximation so uh, this would be exponential of e over uh, r t naught 1 minus uh, actually should have a parenthesis here 1 minus uh, nu over t naught 
and uh, this should be equal to e to the capital nu over r t naught square times e to the minus e over r t naught right and uh, that means this is equal to e to the theta times e to the minus e over r t naught okay. Now let us say let delta equal to q r over k e over r t naught squared r squared well maybe again I am mixing up symbols so we should go back and write um, this as r u and r u r u there are plenty of uh, places where we need to make this correction so and uh, QR over K E over R U T naught squared capital R squared A E to the minus E over R U T naught um, Y uh, Y F power P Y O power, power Q so just, just in case maybe we can just go back and put Q dots there uh, um, okay. So if you now do this go back to your um, original equation so this is where we were and uh, we did all these things and so finally what you are going to get is um, we get d squared theta over d eta squared equal to minus delta e theta that is really what I nice what I like about these non dimensionalizations you know it kind of like uh, um, you have you have been to a haircutting saloon and uh, got got yourself a nice haircut so the uh, governing equation now becomes so looking compact right. Uh, so So for the boundary conditions we have x equals in our new coordinates eta equal to 0 we have to suppose that dt over dx equal to 0 by symmetry and uh, x equals r uh, which implies eta equals 1 uh, we have to have t equals t naught if t is equal to t naught then uh, nu equal to 0 if nu is equal to 0 then theta is equal to 0 right theta equal to 0. Now let us now do something like a linear uh, linearization so take e to the theta as 1 plus theta that means you do a Taylor expansion and chop off things that are going a square and so on. So if you do this then um, that is pretty straightforward what this means is uh, e to the d squared theta divided by e to d e to squared plus delta theta equals minus delta so you just go back and plug e to the t theta is 1 plus theta in this and uh, expand out and take the term with the theta to the left hand side so that you have a differential equation that looks a lot more familiar when compared to what we are used what, what we are, what we have been having and uh, uh, therefore theta equals let us say a1 sin square root of delta eta plus a2 cosine square root of delta eta minus 1 right so you have the complementary uh, part and the particular integral there and uh, therefore 
you get d theta over dx from here as square root of delta times a1 cosine square root of delta eta minus a2 sine square root of delta eta. So if you now supply the boundary conditions the symmetry boundary condition implies that uh, you, you now plug your eta equal to 0 and uh, the sine term goes away and then you now say that d theta by dx should be equal to 0 which is the same as dt by dx equal to 0 that means uh, that the cosine is actually going to 1 therefore a1 should be equal to 0 and uh, at the wall theta equal to 0 this means uh, 0 equal to a2 cosine that's coming from there cosine delta cosine delta uh, minus 1 right so from here we get a2 equal to 1 over cosine square root delta and uh, theta now becomes cosine um, square root delta eta divided by cosine square root delta minus 1 right. So with this what this means is we need look at what is theta is theta is t minus t naught times e over this right. So for the solution what we are looking for is ignition that means we need to have some ignition energy that is there that is going to raise this temperature from t naught to whatever value that will create the reactions to happen significantly therefore obviously t has to be greater than t naught so theta has to have positive solutions. Right, so one of the things that we have to look for is of course eta is a variable so that is that is varying and you have to make sure that you have to have this one for the range of eta's that we are looking at between 0 and 1 should be greater than 1 right. But more than that what we have to worry about is so uh, we need theta greater than 1 everywhere. for ignition more than that um, we need theta to be bounded okay it is one thing to actually have uh, sorry greater than 0 right. So more than more than theta just being positive we also want to make sure that theta does not really blow up right. So also also the solution becomes unbounded unbounded for cosine square root delta going to 0. So if the denominator goes to 0 uh, in even in the first term then you are in trouble uh, which implies that uh, square root of delta is pi by 2 right or you can say delta is equal to pi squared by 4. Um, so if this is the case then you do not have a steady state solution so uh, no steady state solution no steady state solution exists exists for uh, this value and above. Now unlike problems that have this kind of a governing equation at least for the homogeneous part where we would be looking for oscillatory situation and eigenvalues having 
multiple values right so obviously you can say that cosine square root of delta is going to be is going to be 0 when delta is equal to pi by 2 3 pi by 2 5 pi by 2 and so on but that is not what we are interested in right so as you now have the delta actually keep on increasing you now reach this value and that is bad enough we do not have to worry about the next value it is going to reach the next value those things are not basically basically physical anymore what we are interested in is like let us say the first value why are we interested in that because delta for you what we are looking for is the capital R squared as your as your uh, size uh, so long as your size is less than a certain critical value you are now going to have more loss when compared to the uh, heating by the chemical reactions and uh, at ignition what we are saying is this equality happens. So this equality begins to happen for a certain minimum critical value of capital R over here and there is therefore a corresponding delta beyond which ignition will happen and again this, this equality would not hold good because you will now have more heat release due to chemical reactions than the conduction at the walls and then the, and the reaction grows and then you now have an ignition right. Before uh, the critical value of capital R or below the critical value of capital R and correspondingly a less value of, uh, less than the critical value of delta you are going to have uh, the heat loss to be greater than the chemical reaction therefore ignition would not happen right. Therefore uh, what we are basically looking for is this implies that delta critical has, has a minimum value for ignition right. Now if you go back and look at this delta and let us not worry about uh, how this delta is really formed let us now begin to look at the dependencies. Um, so looking at, at uh, dependencies of delta, delta crit right and this is always something that we have been thinking about we always have to have uh, or crit squared and since you have these dependences here that is going to now have a pressure dependence show up through the concentrations. So you are going to have a P over N show up here and of course we have a e to the uh, e to the minus E over R U T naught showing up. T naught and you have a T naught square at the bottom right T naught square. Now this should be uh, depends on so let us say equal to equal to a constant right. Now the constant here that we are talking about is pi by 2 in, in, in this analysis and as I said let us not even worry about the next values and so on but in reality this constant is empirical it is not it is not exactly this that is because we are, we are losing a lot of uh, <coughs> things first of all you are kind of assuming a momentary steady state here that this this equals that at just this particular point but there was it is it, a dynamic process you have an unsteady process essentially and then we are not really worried about um, the variation in, in the temperature with time when, when this ignition is happening. So we uh, assumed a steady state process and then looked at when it is violated. So this, this formulation is somewhat um, uh, limited in, in the way it is done but the most important thing that we are looking for is the dependences on pressure and temperature the, the pressure of the system and the initial temperature of the reactants that is what we are looking at and therefore we simply say this uh, should be equal to a constant or if you now have this this greater than a constant then you will have ignition or if you want to avoid ignition like for example you want to now say uh, I, I have a very narrow tube 
and, uh, and they have reactant mixture that is being sent through the tube and I want to make sure that it does not get ignited then the, the R critical should be less than this constant value right. So that is typically obtained uh, empirically the, the actual value of uh, um, this. So here what we can see is um, that R crit then uh, uh, squared goes as 1 over P n P, P, sorry P to the n keep that in mind and also you now have a slightly complicated uh, T naught dependence okay. Now let us also now look at uh, what is the situation if you now have like a spark ignition okay. So what we have done is something like a thermal ignition where we are trying to heat up uh, otherwise so but spark ignition is slightly different you need to have electrical energy put in there and spark ignition is something that is very commonly adopted in many ignition uh, situations of practical uh, in practical systems. So um, our goal here is uh, twofold one is looking at something like a R critical similar to this and I will show you that a similar dependence can be obtained by looking at the global energy balance similar to the way we were doing for the for the quenching. So <coughs> find minimum ignition energy right. So what we are looking for is if you now have a, a spark that is coming up and uh, you now have a flame that is now growing from here spherically locally spherically that is how it is going to happen. So strictly speaking we should be looking at a, a, a critical radius for the spherical flame that will, that will sustain growing propagating instead of giving away the heat that is liberated during this ignition to the uh, surroundings. So if you really think about this let us suppose that as I said long ago you, you fill this room with reactant mixture okay and then you pray that you are not going to it is not going to get ignited and what happens when it gets ignited. Or why is it so uh, is reaction going on when it is not getting ignited that was a question that we were asking before. The answer is according to the Arrhenius law because it is actually at some temperature the reactions are going on okay but the reaction rates are so low that the heat release rate is so low that it is just getting conducted away to the surroundings from where it is happening right. So therefore what we are basically looking for is what is the energy that is being supplied by the spark that will actually ignite a critical size of this flame ball whose surface is so large now that the chemical energy release that is happening in this is sufficient to overcome the heat loss to the surroundings right. So that is what we are essentially looking for so um, the, the, the flame will not propagate. If um, the radius of, uh, of a spherical, spherically uh, propagating flame is uh, less than a critical value. And the idea is very similar to what we have seen so far. So that is uh, at this stage QR dot equals QL dot and uh, that is to say W heat release so okay, reaction rate times heat of reaction that is heat release rate times 4 by 3 pi R crit squared sorry cube 
should now be equal to conduction uh, conductivity times 4 pi r, r crit squared that is the surface area times Tf minus T naught divided by R crit that is to say we are now basically assuming that locally the temperature is high all right but then this gives rise to a temperature fall just outside this ball and now therefore you have a heat loss. In fact um, if this is your T naught let us let us do this on this side and this is your Tf you could actually take a, 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 a cylindrical column let us suppose that you now think about like a hollow cylinder that means a cylinder of a wall thickness right. So you have an inner radius inner diameter and an outer diameter or inner radius or outer radius and um, the, the temperature inside is uniformly Tf okay and now you tend the outer, outer radius to infinity okay. So it is kind of like a, a hole in the middle of nowhere right and then the, the hole is with a Tf and far from here is actually T naught you should now be able to do a conduction problem for this particular situation and then try to find out what is the heat, uh, heat, uh, heat transfer at the wall and you should be able to show that this is what it is right. So if you, if you do that then from here of course you can uh, so you can cancel this R crit here to from here and then this from there and get a squared so R crit squared then is like 3k Tf minus T naught divided by W dot QR keep in mind previously we had a W dot which we had to expand in terms of temperature because we are using a differential equation in temperature but here we are not really writing a differential equation uh, in temperature the values of the temperature are actually placed as well uh, as specific limits therefore we should not have to worry about expanding this in terms of the Arrhenius law on the law of Mauss action here we can just keep it this way and uh, previously we also said that this QR is nothing but Cp times Tf minus T naught so we do not have to worry about the Tf by T naught but keep the Cp at the bottom and if you now have a K over Cp that can be directly written in terms of alpha right. So if you, if you now find this R crit squared is equal to alpha similar as alpha divided by W dot Similarly, we also had SL squared is equal to square root. Sorry, SL is equal to square root of alpha W dot, or SL squared is um, alpha W dot, right? So, if you now think think about R crit squared is equal to, uh, going as alpha divided by W dot, SL squared is going as alpha W dot. Then you can directly get from here. We can see that. We can see that R crit. goes as alpha over SL as before as before is during quenching right. Now I want to caution you that you now have a number 3 here that is coming from um, the volume to surface area kind of consideration but in reality we do not have this kind of number it is more than that right and I um, will point that out that this was related to the penetration distance yesterday. Uh, when we are doing ignition. So if you now say we are interested in the energy so if you oppose if you now say that the E ignition the energy that the spark is going to deposit into this gas is supposed to go and increase the a critical mass of gas um, M crit to the temperature Tf minus T naught right that is what this is supposed to do that this energy right and in fact if you think about this this is essentially the, sta the, the, the statement of the second criterion that we wrote yesterday as a rule of thumb and uh, this is actually relating to the first criterion as a rule of thumb. So we are kind of applying both in stages and uh, this M crit now is essentially like a like a pocket of gas of a certain critical mass and therefore it is going to be density times a critical volume and the critical volume is associated with the critical radius that we are looking at 
So therefore we can now plug the critical radius there. So this is nothing but 4 by 3 pi r crit squared uh, I'm sorry r crit, r crit cube um, you, you also have a density uh, this is this, this density is uh, uh, for the pocket of gas that is got ignited therefore you are looking at products within the sphere right so you need to have a row infinity there and uh, Cp Tf minus T naught and uh, so this implies that uh, ignition let us not worry about the 4 by 3 pi let us now begin to look at the dependence and uh, so what we see because we are now looking back again at the R crit uh, going as um, alpha over SL as the dependence and uh, therefore this depends um, on keep the CP all right and um, write your rho infinity as P over R infinity TF right and uh, keep the TF minus T naught all right and then look at R crit R crit is nothing but alpha over SL as a dependence therefore this is going to now go as alpha over SL the whole cubed right and uh, in fact putting everything together in terms of how the alpha depends on pressure uh, and uh, the pressure dependence here itself and SL's pressure dependence everything together we will retrieve from here uh, we could deduce that uh, E ignition E ignition goes as uh, P to the minus 2 for uh, N approximately equal to 2 this is for uh, if you now go back here you are talking about P to the N N is the order of the reaction that means if you are now looking at a global reaction with a law of mass action like this it is essentially P plus Q right so N equal to 2 is the order of the reaction if you now plug that in there for the SL dependence on pressure uh, you should now get this taking other other pressure dependences in this expression into account and this is for typical hydrocarbons right and this actually pretty much gives a good dependence compared to experiments right. So if you now think about how um, the experimental dependence is so experimentally it is observed that if you now try to plot your E ignition uh, versus pressure and um, of course if you now do this on a log log scale right we should now get a straight line that goes downwards um, but what we find is typically this uh, the, the data goes more like this which means uh, this is the P to the minus 2 dependence and uh, the, the P to the minus 2 dependence is actually fairly well satisfied in the low pressure region when compared to the high pressure high pressure you do not uh, have this fall so that means you, you, do, you do have a critical ignition still needed it means that the ignition energy needed is more than what the pressure dependence would say and of course that, that, that implies a kinetics effect as well that means there is uh, the, the uh, reactions do not behave exactly the same way in terms of the global kinetics is concerned. And uh, the other thing uh, obviously we are interested in is the temperature dependence and uh, there, there, there is some data to suggest that uh, if uh, for so the temperature dependence uh, like for example if you now say uh, for increase in uh, the 3 let us say 300 to 450 degrees C sorry Kelvin uh, Kelvin range um, right uh, the uh, E ignition ignition drops from uh, around tens of millijoules to uh, a few millijoules that means 
we are looking at numbers like about 40 millijoules to 70 millijoules at uh, 300 k whereas uh, when you now go to like 450 k you need only about 4 millijoules 5 millijoules kind of thing right. So as the temperature the initial temperature is increased the ignition energy required minimum ignition energy required is uh, less correspondingly. Uh, but you can actually work out how this exact dependence is itself from uh, uh, from here okay. So with this we should conclude um, ignition and as well we would like to stop talking about premix flames is that essentially what we have done is we have spent significant amount of time talking about premix flame deflagrations we have not done premix flame detonations starting from where we did the rankine hugonio relations and we saw that you have one branch is actually for deflagration so the other branch is detonation but essentially the idea is for premix flames right uh, we, we, were, we were always assuming that the reactants were approaching the flame uh, in a premix state and uh, then we started asking the question uh, uh, how do you con how do you know what is the slope of the Rayleigh line and uh, that is actually corresponding to the flame speed and uh, so that actually turns out to be an eigenvalue of the system. Uh, if you now look at uh, how the equations pan out looking at how the preheat zone and the reaction zone is then we constructed the um, preheat zone temperature profile and the reaction zone temperature profile to, uh, to um, zeroth order we just say this is a convective react, um, uh, diffusive zone that is a reactive diffusive zone and then we neglect the, the other terms that are in, uh, unimportant like the reaction zone reaction rate term in the preheat zone and the convective term in the uh, reaction zone and uh, construct temperature profiles match the slopes of the interface um, and then try to get the flame speed and then we started looking at the dependence on dependence of spin, the flame speed on physical chemical uh, properties initial conditions uh, or the reactant conditions pressure and temperature and so on and uh, then uh, we looked at uh, the flame shapes how the flame actually gets shaped uh, over a burner and how it gets stabilized and what happens to it at the peak at the, at the tip when you have a flame curvature and a flow divergence effect and uh, then we started looking at flammability limits and uh, quenching criteria and ignition criteria and so on. So all these things actually we have been talking about are primarily in the context of premix deflag laminar deflagration right. So it is time we started talking about diffusion flames and uh, so now onwards uh, for the rest of the time or at least for quite some time we should now be talking about diffusion flames. We are still uh, primarily in the deflagration regime uh, that is we are looking at low subsonic uh, Mach numbers for the, for the reactant flow and therefore we have to go back and look at the momentum equation and find that the pressure is approximately a constant because we are now looking at low Mach numbers and low Knudsen numbers and therefore uh, it, it just reduces to pressure it is a constant which means we can go back and adopt like the schwab zeldovich kind of formulation and where we have to look at the species conservation equation and the energy conservation equation uh, with a flow field that is prescribed unless of course you want to take into account the density variation with temperature which will alter the flow field and you can now look at the flow problem um, loosely coupled with the combustion problem and not necessarily tightly coupled in uh, unlike, unlike in a full compressible manner. So we will now begin to start talking about diffusion flames. Now diffusion flames is actually kind of like the classical term uh, for uh, flames that are essentially non premixed. So the, the modern uh, terminology for this is simply non premixed flames. So we have to understand why we are getting these, these uh, different semantic notions about this. Uh, what, we meant be a, what we mean by a diffusion flame is here we are now saying that the reactants are just mixing at the flame right it is kind of like uh, you are you're rushing into the exam hall and you are just studying for the exam right so you are really not prepared. Uh, so similarly the reactants are not really prepared and what is meant by prepared? prepared that means you have to actually pre mix right. So if the reactants are pre mixed 
then they are ready to react and all they are waiting for is for a temperature rise to happen and then they are going to react right and uh, at a steady state, in a steady state situation the temperature rise happens because of the flame that has already been established and so as the reactants get into the flame they get preheated and then react that is what the flame is all about that is why that is how we were talking about it. But in this case you have a flame all right but the reactants are just mixing at the time they are reacting right. So when that is happening then you have to start thinking about which is faster which is a faster process is it the um, um, mixing is it going to be quite fast or is it the reactions that are going to be quite fast. Right. Now typically in a combustion situation what we are interested in is fast exo exothermic reactions right this is what we started talking about right at the beginning. So we are always interested in situations where we have a very high sensitivity of the reaction rate to temperature in, in turn meaning a high activation energy right and that simply means that the reaction rates are going to be very very fast once you got the mixing to happen. Right. So this is a situation where the mixing is the one that is limiting the, pro the entire set of processes. In other words if the fuel and air were to mix or the fuel and oxidizer were to mix with each other then the reactions will happen rather instantaneously or immediately right. So mixing is the rate limiting process in, in, in case of diffusion flames and of course the, the technical sounding term for mixing is diffusion. So you can say diffusion is the rate limiting process and therefore the heat that is released from a diffusion flame is not necessarily limited by the chemical kinetics as in the case of premix flames. So you would say there premix flames are kinetically limited in terms of heat release whereas in the case of uh, diffusion flames you should say it is diffusion limited right. So you are not going to really experience the as much heating uh, there than uh, premix flames so that is essentially the idea. So here the, the, the uh, mixing between the reactants or mixing of the reactants is the rate limiting process relative to relative to reaction uh, therefore the heat release in a non premix flame is diffusion limited. Uh, as opposed to as opposed to being kinetically limited in a premix flame hence the name diffusion flame for these but we will see that there is some exception here I mean we will we will we will, we will just keep building this idea and then see where it falters okay. So uh, at the moment the idea basically is that diffusion is the rate limiting process and therefore the heat release is diffusion limited rather than or, or the heat can be released only to the extent but to which the reactants can mix uh, then uh, whether they can actually release by chemical kinetics like, the, like what is the chemical reaction rate based on law of mass action and so on. So <coughs> The thing that we have to uh, think about is are these very common in fact these are actually more common when compared to the premix flames. Premix flames pretty much have to be contrived many times you have to mix somebody has to mix the reactants right whereas diffusion flames are the ones that ha happen naturally in nature right. So if you want to for example um, light fire to a, a, a block of wood or something like that that is essentially a diffusion flame that is going on right and uh, candle flames are the best example right. So, so the, the candle flame is essentially a, uh, 
diffusion flame. So the, the laboratory if you want to now establish a diffusion flame take go back to the Bunsen burner that we have been talking about but you now shut down the air entrainment along with the fuel at the bottom right and just allow the fuel to come along and have the air mix with the fuel outside and that is that is a pretty good interesting experiment that you can think about. So if you now had a, a Bunsen burner and you now had the uh, bottom ring open uh, pretty much fully and you had this orifice through which the fuel is coming out like a jet and creates a locally low pressure so that the air gets sucked in and, 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 and entrains into the fuel and then mixes into this tube and then you now have a nice conical blue um, premix flame and then you now start slowly trying to uh, move this ring so that the hole is actually progressively closed and you are letting in less and less air and as you let in less and less air you are making this flame more and more fuel rich because you just have more and more fuel and less and less air so it becomes fuel rich and we talked about fuel rich uh, premix flames earlier in the context of stabilization and what we understand is um, two things one um, as the air entrains at the base of the flame you are going to have a, a enrichment of this mixture and it is going to be closer to the stoichiometric and actually get anchored much more uh, uh, firmly. The other thing is for the remaining shoulder of the flame you are going to have a fuel rich um, products that are coming out and that, that is going to mix with the reactants and have a diffusion flame envelope right. So ultimately when you now close this ring completely and you know do not let in any more fuel then what is happening is you, you have only fuel coming out uh, and then you have mixing of air that is happening and typically what you should find is you now have a diffusion flame that is fairly elongated when compared to a, a more compact premixed conical flame and this is going to now <coughs> look not exactly shaped uh, uh, like a cone anymore right it is going to have like a, a teardrop kind of uh, shape and uh, it is not blue, in, blue any longer it is more um, orange and yellowish in some pockets and so on so it is essentially typically your orange flame. So what this means is you have inside of the flame you have all fuel outside of the flame you have all oxidizer at the flame you are basically having the two mix and produce products and of course the products are free to diffuse on either side and they are in, in general getting convected upwards and of, of course the whole set of um, uh, species are actually moving upwards because of buoyancy that is another uh, that is another matter in a gravitational field around and that is and uh, that is partly the reason why you are seeing this this kind of a shape for the flame uh, and uh, uh, and also the reason why the flame looks elongated besides uh, uh, the diffusion process itself causing it elongate uh, when compared to a compact conical premix flame. Uh, so the, these are lots of these kinds of different things are happening as you now change this from a premix flame to a diffusion flame which is a nice experiment that to uh, for, for you to think about and do. So, uh, so, so diffusion flame can be commonly uh, come, acro come across and uh, we will now talk about how to anal analyze this uh, next class.